Play the ballad video where he wears his cap backwards? All right. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into Lethal Company videos, I'd only play Lethal Company if I had friend friends to play Lethal Company. That game looks fun. <clears throat> but it also requires friendships and time to have those friendships, which I have neither. I mean, I, 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 have, I, have, I have some friends, but it's like, we, we all don't have time. Two, two We're adults. Stories. If you're a fan of the strange, Imagine. mysterious, delivered in story format, being an adult is cringe, right dude. Don't do it. All we do, and we upload. Die before you're 20. No, die when die before you're 22. Then you'll never have to worry about responsibility. I mean, I guess that depends. Maybe 18. I don't know once a week so if that i'm not telling you to kill yourself by the way that was a joke that's of interest to you the next time you're at the like button's house and need to use their bathroom don't use the <clears throat> toilet paper or Instead, just stop aging dozens true and dozens of quadruple ply paper towels also please uh, 7:20 p.m. on the evening of December 11th, 2002, a police department in a rural English county called Surrey started receiving all these frantic emergencies. Surrey. That's how you say it, Bolin. It's not Surrey. It's Surrey. Off to a bad start. Agency calls. Now, all of these calls were coming from <clears throat> drivers on a heavily trafficked highway called the A3, and they all were saying, "It's the I3, not the A3. The I3." Saying the same things. They had seen this totally reckless driver with super bright headlights that was weaving in and out of traffic and going at high speeds and nearly crashing into people. And then a couple of the callers said they actually saw this car go down the embankment off the side of the highway. And so it looked like they might have crashed. And so, of course, this police department, after getting all these calls, decided to send out a couple Fucking of officers to see what was going on. Drivers. When the two officers got out to the A3 and began patrolling the area on the A3 where all these calls were saying they had seen this reckless driver, they didn't see Go the shift on the A3, they didn't see bro. a wreck on the side of the road, they didn't see any signs of an accident, I mean there was nothing there. Now, had only one person called in about this wild, reckless driver, at this point the officers would have chalked this up to a mistake or even a prank. But so many people called in about this one particular reckless driver on the A3 that these two officers decided to just keep on looking and really see if they can figure out where this driver went. And so to this point, the two police officers had been just driving on the A3 to try to find this driver. And so they decided they would park their vehicle, get out and walk on foot on the edge of the highway because there were these huge forests that lined either side of the A3. In fact, Surrey, the county in England where this was, Sorry. was one of the most heavily forested areas in all of England. And so these forests on either side of the A3 were very dense. You could not see very far into them. And so these officers were thinking Ghost that car, it might I'm be calling possible it. that this driver, <clears throat> if they were driving, Remember at the beginning of the video, he said truth is sometimes scarier than fiction. Having as recklessly as all the... So, and obviously, uh, ghosts are fiction, so... Callers made it seem like they could have veered off the highway, gone down the embankment, and then because they were going at such a high speed, they could have crashed their way into one of these forests and basically disappeared from view from the road. That in order to see this crash in the forest, you'd have to be basically in the forest. And so these two officers, they pulled over, they got out, and they began walking along the edge of the highway, staring into the forest, looking for a sign of a car wreck. And Real sure photo. enough, after walking for a while, one of the officers spotted something deep in the woods that looked almost metallic you or wear plastic. The cummy, man. Whatever it was, True. it wasn't it is supposed a forest. to be in the forest. And so the officers made their way into the tree line and began walking through all the trees. And as they got closer, they realized very clearly there was a car. There was a wreck in the forest. And so the two officers, they begin running towards the wreck. They're calling for backup on the radio. They get to this wreck in the middle of the forest and they're on the driver's side and they look inside the car and there's no driver in the driver's seat, but they looked through the car to the passenger side and they saw the front passenger door was wide open and on the ground on the other side of the car was very clearly a body. 
And so the two police officers rushed around the car to get a better look at the body. And when they did, you know, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It didn't make any sense. Like, what was this? Have you seen the GTA trailer? It looks amazing. I don't know. I don't know about that. Now, to understand why these police officers were so caught off guard by what they were seeing, we need to go back five months to <clears throat> July 16th, 2002. On that night, a 21-year-old man named Christopher Brian Chandler finished up his beer at a pub in West London. And for reference, where this pub... Pub! was located was about one hour north of that stretch of the A3 highway in Surrey where the car was found in the woods. This night, Christopher had gone to this pub with a close friend of his. This was meant to be a fun night out. But, you know, as Chris is finishing up this beer, he began to feel really antsy because it turned out Christopher was actually wanted by police in London for oh. robbery. And so he hated staying in one place for too long. And so the only... <laughs> he was getting anxiety for, like, work or something like that. Yeah, he's drinking a beer. He's getting a little bit anxiety because he's on the run from the cops. Just like, okay. The people who even knew where Christopher was, was the friend he was with at the bar, and then also Christopher's brother. He knew he was at this particular pub. And so finally, Christopher got so anxious about being in this pub for too long that he told the friend he was with that he just wanted to leave. And so he said goodnight to his friend. The friend stayed at the pub, and Christopher left, got in his car, and began driving south. But Christopher never yeah, arrived to the best at of the us. place he was trying to go. He just sort of disappeared I'm a and I'm no one in five him. countries for murder. Christopher's brother eventually would report Christopher missing, but remember, the brother knows Christopher is wanted for robbery, and so Christopher suddenly going on the lam and just disappearing for a while. On the run for robbery? Bro, what did he rob? A car? It was kind of par for the course, and so the brother really didn't think this was a big deal. And also, the police felt the same way because they know Christopher is trying to elude them, and so it makes sense he would be missing. And so as a result... I mean, that, that wouldn't be robbery. That'd be car... jacking. A GTA! It all, it all connects! Stealing cars! Salt, nobody really followed up on Christopher's missing person report. Everybody just kind of moved on. That is, until five months later, when all those drivers began calling into the police <clears throat> in Surrey about seeing this totally reckless driver careening down the A3, who eventually crashed into a ditch. And then those two officers, they went out to that stretch of A3, and sure enough, it was Christopher's car, and the body on the ground was Christopher. However, oh. there was a problem. When the two police officers walked up on Christopher's car and saw it for the first time, they were struck by how old it looked. But it didn't really register with them why that would matter. It just stood out to them that this is a really, really old and rusted up car. But when they went around to look at the body on the ground, Christopher's body, they saw that his body was actually mostly a skeleton, which meant Christopher did not crash and die the on fuck? this night, December 11th, 2002, very likely, he crashed and died five months earlier, right around the time he disappeared. Now, the Surrey police, they say that this was all just one big coincidence. That the reckless driver that all these drivers were reporting that night on the A3 must have not crashed and actually just kind of got away. And then just by coincidence, when the police were searching that area of the A3 for the reckless driver, they happened upon Chris Dude, and if his it's car. a ghost car, but remember, I'm going to get several upset. of the drivers who called in that night about seeing this reckless driver on the A3, they specifically said they saw the car veer <clears> off <throat> the embankment and crash down below near the tree line. Like, this is a serious crash. Someone needs to get out here with an ambulance because probably someone's hurt. Ghost Rider could be. And then when we? the police got out and <clears throat> searched the exact area where this crash supposedly happened, they find Chris's car that had all the hallmarks of a car that was driving recklessly on the A3 that veered off and crashed into the woods. I mean, they found Chris and his car because of these calls. But it could not have been Chris. But what other car could it Yeah, it's going to be like the ending of, of today, Spirited Away. We do away. not have a good explanation for how this happened. And so it's been dubbed the A3 Ghost Crash. Well, we finally did it. I don't know if it was all the acid we poured into their contact lens solution, or if it was all the wild predators we released in their...
supplies oh, last. Merch. So again, go to shop Mr. Okay, what? Huh? What? Did I miss something? <clears throat> On the morning of August 2nd, 2017, two men sat together laughing inside of a bar in a tiny village in northern France. The men were named Lucien Perrault and Olivier Boudin, and even though there was a massive age difference between them, Lucien was 69 years old and ha! Olivier was 38 years old, the two were totally inseparable, to the point where the people in the village referred to them as father and son. Lucien had spent his whole life working in manufacturing in a nearby city, but just four years earlier, he had finally retired and he had moved into a small home inside of this northern French village. But when he had Dude, my French is on home, point today. Holy shit. very lonely and sad. You know, Lucian was divorced, he struggled <clears> with <throat> alcohol, and he had had a really tough life, and he just wasn't doing well. But when he met Olivier, his whole life turned around. When the two met, Olivier also was kind of like a down-on-his-luck guy. He was struggling with some health issues that made it hard to work, and so for years, he had been bouncing between the nearby city and this village. Speak like a natural? France, yeah, I've heard that a lot. Somewhat unsuccessfully. And so when these two happened to connect, <clears throat> it's like they bonded over having kind of difficult lives. And for Lucian, what really mattered to him was Olivier, despite being so much younger than him, did not treat him, did not treat Lucian like he was this dried up, worthless old man. He treated Lucian like a peer. And so together, these two very unlikely best friends began kind of orchestrating their lives around the other. And before long, it was like their lives had all this new structure That's and pretty cool, actually. And meaning to them. <clears throat> because again, the two men got to be together basically all day long. So, on this particular morning, as Olivier and Lucien were together at this bar, they began to talk talking about what they wanted to do that night. And they settled on having a barbecue at Lucien's house. Lucien would cook up some beef and they would sit out on his back garden patio and just spend the night together. It sounded like a wonderful plan. And in fact, the bartender would say that when Olivier and Lucien finally left the bar that day, that he recalled overhearing them being so excited about this particular Dude, barbecue. that's actually really and so awesome that evening, and cool. Olivier and Lucien arrived at Lucien's house and they went out to the back Not patio lie. where Lucien had <clears> already <throat> draped a nice tablecloth over this small round table. It was a red and white checkered pattern tablecloth. And on this table was an open bottle of wine and some Yo! cheese and a baguette. And so Olivier, he sat down and began enjoying some wine and bread. And Lucien walked over to the grill and began cooking up the beef. Lucian had a neighbor, we're going to call her Marie because we don't actually know her real name, and Marie's second floor window overlooked Lucian's garden patio where the two men were having this cookout. And so that night, Marie did glance out and saw the two men kind of listening to music and goofing around, and she was used to them spending lots of time together, and she was also used to them staying up late at night, <clears throat> and so she figured, you know, tonight's going to be another one of those nights where these guys are up late, having wine, celebrating, whatever, you know, she was just going to shut the window and try to ignore the noise coming in and just let them do their thing. And so eventually, Marie would do that. She would go to bed to the sound of music coming from next door and the sound of men talking. And then the next morning, when Marie got up around 6 a.m., she looked out that window again and, frankly, was not that shocked at what she saw. Lucian was still just sitting at the table, looking like he could be eating some bread or still drinking wine. God damn, that... And Olivier had clearly passed out on the ground. Jesus. Now, Marie didn't judge. <clears throat> she knew these two liked to stay up late and drink and do stuff like this. And Until so she 6 thought, in the what? morning? None of my business. Then, at 9 a.m., so three hours after Marie had first woken up, she left her house to go to another neighbor's house to feed their chickens while they were away for the day. As she passed by Lucian's house, <clears throat> she glanced into his back garden He's still on the ground. He's still passed out on the ground. Patio, he? And she saw Lucian was still just sitting at the table and Olivier was still passed out on the ground. It uh -oh. was like they hadn't moved for three hours. But again, Marie's thinking, none of my business. Uh so she just kept oh. on going, went to her neighbor's house and fed the chickens. But when Marie came back to her house three hours later around noon, she looked again into Lucian's backyard and she saw the two men still had not moved. 
Lucian is sitting at the table and Olivier is laying on the ground. And suddenly Marie's thinking, wait a minute, you know, the sun is high in the sky right now. These guys aren't moving. They're going to get heat stroke. You know, we got to do something about this. And so she Could yelled be, I, out I don't know. to Olivier I don't think it's Lucian, alcohol but poisoning. she got no response. And so Marie just walked into Lucian's backyard. And as she got closer and closer to the two men, she realized that they were not moving at all. Like they were not breathing. Something was horribly wrong here. And so Marie, she just turned and ran to another neighbor's house. She told them what was going on. And they got these big pots of water and they ran back and doused Olivier and Lucian with water, trying to get them to snap out of their drunken stupor but the two men did not move at all when the water hit them. Clearly, they were dead. The next Guys day, the local prosecutor announced there was going to be an investigation into the two men's deaths, which were being classified as criminal acts. And the prosecutor also said that it seemed like Lucian and Olivier- were they, What if they made like a suicide pact? What if it was like they became best friends because they were bonding over their trauma and shit and then they realized that they wanted to commit suicide so they decided to commit suicide together and then poison the wine? Died at the same time and so most likely this was either a double homicide or a murder suicide and the primary theory as to what <clears throat> killed the two men was poison put in their food. And so police sent off the canned beans the two men were eating to this institution in Paris to test it the for something cryptid. called botulism, which is a deadly toxin <clears throat> that will grow inside of- Yo! Yo! Big raid! What's up, YMS? Thanks, man. What the fuck? We're watching spooky, scary videos. Thank you so much for the raid. What's up, raiders? Uh, context of what's happening right now. Two dudes, one old, one in his middle aged, uh, were partying late at night. And then uh, a lady next door woke up. They weren't moving, both dead. Scary. Canned foods, but it came back negative. And yeah, the old one's 69, so it's funny. The food the two men were eating <clears throat> to various other laboratories. All right, see you, man. Thank you so much for the raid. And again, all of it came back negative. There was nothing that the police could detect in any of the food they ate. And so police were kind of confused for a minute, but then the autopsies came back for Olivier and Lucien and everything changed. Lucien and Olivier were not murdered. This was not a murder-suicide. They didn't die from botulism or from some poison in their food. All right. They died because of a set of very particular circumstances. Both Lucien and Olivier suffered from non-fatal minor medical issues. Lucien had- Huh? What? <laughs> what, they both died from a culmination of minor problems? What? Had bad dental health and so was missing a couple of teeth. And Olivier was suffering from a heart <clears throat> condition called cardiomegaly, which means his heart was slightly enlarged and somewhat fragile. However, his condition was totally being monitored by doctors and was under control. But just for a second, on the night of August 2nd, 2017. Dude, that's terrifying thinking about like all the shit that you just like ignore health wise. It like cul cul culminates after a while and you just fucking die from it. When Lucian and Olivier were having that cookout in Lucian's backyard, their non fatal. So they died minor just because? Yeah. Suddenly became a really, <clears throat> really big deal. Lucian cooked up a big plate of beef rib. Now, beef rib Damn, can be difficult good. to chew, even when you have all your teeth and take your time. But Lucian was missing teeth, and he loved this beef rib so much, he was wolfing it down really quickly, and so he wasn't chewing it enough. No at way. At some point, he swallowed a particularly big, unchewed bite. No and he way. To choke. And Did he choke and die, and the other dude had a heart attack? Dude. What? When that happened, his best buddy, Olivier, sitting across from him, he stood up to try to help his friend who's basically dying right in front of him. And the stress of this moment no caused way. his heart to seize up, his heart, which is already enlarged and fragile, and he had a heart a real attack. photo of a different beef rib. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and died. 
And then Lucian, who now has no one to help him, continued to sit at the table trying to get this beef out of his throat, but he couldn't, and he eventually asphyxiated and died as well. What the fuck? Dude, that's so sad. They were such like a wholesome duo, man. But I mean, he did die at 69. No, that's inappropriate. No, don't. Hunched over at the That's not even funny. That's no. Table. That was, uh, no. But I mean, he, that is like a, no, that's, no, no. A little after 7 a.m. on the morning of April 15th, 2007, three men launched a 35 foot. White Not going to lie. It's kind of cute. They died together. They died in like one of the most depressing ways possible. I mean, yeah, they were like in each other's company. But the first dude died because he was. Thank you so much, Princess Lemon Drop, for the gift. But the first one died because he was trying to save his friend. Actually, you know what? The first dude who died wasn't that bad because he died pretty quick trying to save his friend. The other dude, that sucks because not only did you see your friend fucking die trying to save you, but now you have no one to save you and you just have to suffocate to death. That would suck. Catamaran you know, I wonder if that dude didn't die, if, if he was able to, like, uh, save his other friend. I think he, I don't know. ...called the Kaz 2 from a marina in northeastern Australia, kicking off what was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. The captain of the Kaz 2 was 56-year-old Des Batten, and for months he'd been training for this trip. And the two friends that Des was bringing with him on this trip were Jim Tunstead, who was 63 years old, and Jim's brother, Peter Tunstead, who was 69 years old. God, why do they all look the same? <laughs> this fucking handlebar mustache, though. All three of the men had spent a lot of time plotting their actual course. They died watching the on, other die? Which yeah. was from this marina on the northeastern side of Australia, up and around the north side. And Wait, they're 69? The Wait, I missed it! to Perth, which was their final destination, and where all three men lived. In total, this trip was supposed to take eight weeks, and all three men were absolutely giddy with excitement at the prospect of spending an entire two months basically just drinking beers and fishing. Now, Des, Jim, and Peter were hey, not the right. types to Bring blow off responsibility to go I party. I mean, they were devoted God, family damn. men. All of them had been married for 30 plus years. Des had two kids, Jim had four kids, and Peter had five kids. But they were all either retired or see near retirement, and this trip was going to be kind of a way to celebrate the end of an era. And while all three of them had gone on other big sailing trips, this one easily was the biggest one in terms of the distance they were covering and how much prep went into it and how expensive it was. I mean, this was like 10x the scope and scale of any other sailing trip they had done. And so on April 15th, 2007, shortly after the three men had launched their boat and kicked off this big trip, Peter's wife would call him just to see how it was going. And she would say, you know, Peter was in great spirits and she could hear the other two men laughing in the background. And it sounded like they were about to start fishing and maybe have a couple of beers. And so it seemed very much to Peter's wife, like this trip was going as well yeah. as it could be so far. So oh, wait, Peter oh, damn. I didn't know I'd get some of this action. As well as it could be so Hell yeah. So far. And Damn. so eventually, Peter told his wife that he had to go, he told her he loved her, and then they hung up. <clears throat> now, Des, who was the captain Thirst of trap. the Kaz 2, was adamant about safety being the top concern for this trip. Even though all three men were relatively healthy and had a lot of sailing experience, and even though Des was a member of a volunteer marine rescue group and so literally could be called on to go perform rescues at sea, despite all this experience and know-how, before they kicked off this trip, Des <clears throat> made Jim and Peter go through all these man overboard drills on the Kaz 2 right. to make sure they knew how to do it if for some reason, you know, an emergency arose out at sea. 
And so the men got I'm really comfortable an using all the life saving equipment and going over all the procedures. And then also when they charted their course, Des stressed that at no point should they be sailing into open water. Hmm. They needed to stay close to shore the whole time just because it was safer. And so Ah, uh, dude, you cannot tell three old men to stay next to shore. Nope. You, hell, you can't tell three old men to do anything. They're not going to listen to you. Dude, I, I, that's probably what happened. They went out there and was like, Oh, yeah, I think he told us to stay near the shoreline. But yeah, fuck that guy, man. Let's go out there and get the big fish, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, let's get, let's get the big ones. Let's get the, uh, the big you ones. Fart so hard, your balls <clears throat> Tico, thank you so much for the gift. So when Jim began filming a video around 10 a.m. on the day they set sail, for the trip, <laughs> you can well as I see breathe. the shore in the background of this video. So <clears throat> they're following the course they had planned. But a couple of hours after Jim had shot that video on the day they left, a woman named Isabel Wheeler, who did not know Des, Jim, or Peter, and had never seen the cast yeah, and they're before, Australian. Good point. She was fishing in an area called Champagne Bay when she looked out into the water and she saw the Kaz 2, a white 35 foot catamaran sailing east to west across the horizon. And then at some point, as Isabel was watching this boat, which really meant nothing to her, she just happened to be watching it, she saw it make a quick 90 degree turn and began sailing out towards the open ocean away from the coastline. Now, remember, it fucking Sandy boys, let's go out to the deep blue. Let's catch ourselves a goddamn whale. Dude, they had they probably had too many beers, man. Isabel knows nothing of this boat or its occupants and so has no Damn idea woke kids that telling Des, me what Peter, to and do. Jim had been so clear about at no point will we sail into the open ocean. It's too dangerous. Stay close to shore. She didn't know that. And so she just saw a ship turning and sailing out to the open water and she thought, okay, whatever. You know, so she didn't go and report what she saw. It was only later on when details emerged about what happened on the Kaz 2 that she would later come forward and say, hey, I saw that boat and this is what they did. The next day, April 16th, two more people would spot the Kaz 2. These were two men who also did not know Des Peter Jim. They didn't know Kaz 2. They didn't know Isabel. In fact, these two men didn't know each other, but independently on this day, they looked out near Champagne Bay and they saw the Kaz 2 sailing east to west in the exact same spot that Isabel had seen it the day before. Now, remember, the Kaz 2 was traveling from that marina on the northeast side of Australia all the way around to Perth. It was a point A to point B trip. There was no reason the Kaz 2 would ever double back and be in the same place 24 hours later, but here we were 24 hours later, Did they go and in two a more people are seeing the Kaz 2 in the same place the that Isabel had seen it, and so that made no sense. But again, these two men who saw the Kaz 2, they just saw it and thought nothing of it because they don't know anything about this boat. It wasn't until later that they eventually came oh, they've forward been dead with for what a they bit? saw. Then one yeah, it could be a situation where they died. And like they died before like they started moving and the boat sails just kind of took them in a direction. I wonder if that happened. Four day after that, on April 17th, there were these fishermen <sighs> that were out in their boats a little Ran farther out of beer already, of time to turn Bay, back. Isabel and the two other men had seen the Kaz 2 on consecutive days. And these fishermen, they spotted the Kaz 2. And again, these fishermen do not know the Kaz 2. They don't know its occupants. They're just seeing the ship. Except this time, the fishermen, when they saw the Kaz 2, they thought something was wrong because they saw the Kaz 2 from a distance navigating its way fairly close to shore in an area that these fishermen knew was full of coral reefs. It's a very oh, dangerous area no. to be piloting any ship. In addition, the sail of the Kaz 2 was totally ripped to shreds. And so the fishermen, they're looking at the ship, wondering what they're doing, but the pilot of the ship looked so in control, oh. he's navigating his way through the coral reefs. Oh, so they are still up. That the fishermen thought, okay, he knows what he's doing, so <clears throat> you know, leave him alone. But again, later on, they would report what they saw. It wasn't until the next day, April 18th, so three days after Des, Peter, and Jim had set sail, that anybody realized there was an issue with the crew of the Kaz 2. 
because on April 18th, a Coast Watch surveillance helicopter was flying over the Great Barrier Reef, and they looked down and they saw the Kaz-2 with its badly damaged sails, piloting all around this very dangerous part of the water to be piloting. And so the crew on board the helicopter attempted to radio down to the Kaz-2 to see if they were okay, but no one from the Kaz-2 called back to the helicopter. Hmm. And so as they're waiting Ocean for a response from the pilot, from the yeah, Kaz that's what it feels like. The helicopter crew is watching <clears throat> the pilot of the Kaz-2 clearly, you know, navigating the boat in between coral reefs. And it seemed like, you know, despite the damage to the sails, <laughs> <laughs> no! Rick Roll, thank you so much for the five gifted. Shit. And so to the crew on the helicopter, you. this didn't really look like an emergency, but it seemed like something worth flagging. And so they called the Marine police and said, hey, we have this ship here that's not responding. We think they're okay, but you might want to come dragon. take a look. And so the Marine police, they would come out to the area where the helicopter had said they had seen the Kaz-2. And when they got there, the Kaz-2 was gone. At this point, the Marine police got some information about the boat, Kaz-2, and discovered who Sunk. owned the boat and who was on this trip, so Des, Peter, and Jim, and the police would get in touch with all of their families, and they would all tell police that besides Peter's wife, who talked to Peter on that morning they left, no one had heard from any of the men. They had gone totally silent since that first day. And so when police heard this, they knew this had to be some kind of emergency. And so a search was launched to find the Kaz-2. And 48 hours later, a rescue helicopter that was part of the search was about 80 or so miles off the northeastern coast of Australia. Holy when shit. they looked down and they spotted the Kaz-2. And it still had miles? all torn up sails and it was kind of spinning listlessly in the water. And from the helicopter, they couldn't see anybody on board the ship. It was totally vacant on the deck. Now, at this point, authorities really have no idea they what's going on. They were able to identify the pilot. They could have been hijacked. It's okay. I think either his two friends died and he had to take control of everything and he didn't know how to do stuff, maybe. I don't know. This is this is this, oh, this is confusing. Occupants. It was possible that maybe they had been hijacked, <clears throat> and so Des, Peter, and Jim could be held hostage down below, along with the people that took them hostage. Or maybe the boat just got stolen, and Des, Peter, and Jim are not on this boat, and that it's just the criminals on board. And again, they're down below, hidden from view. You know, so authorities they don't know, but they decided to take a risk and just send somebody down to get on that boat and just see what was going on. So a rescue officer on board the rescue helicopter named Corey Benson it's was a bonker, lowered by a yeah. rope where he was dropped into the water. Giga and bonker. then Corey swam by himself over to the Kaz-2 and he climbed up the side of the boat and he stepped onto the deck. And right away he noticed it was kind of like eerily quiet on board the boat. There was nobody he could see and there was no sign of any disturbance minus the sails of the ship being all tattered. And for a second, Corey thought about maybe calling yeah, that was out actually real Des, footage. Peter, and Jim to see That's if they were That's a rare, real footage come moment. up and solve this mystery. But then he also worried that if he called out, there could be some bad people on board this boat, and he didn't want to draw their attention. And so Corey was quiet and just maybe began a lightning walking strike? towards the front of the boat. And I feel like there did, would be more evidence of that, like a that burn People must have recently been on board <clears throat> this boat doing normal things. Like, for example, there was a fishing rod that was cast out into the water that was anchored to a post on the side of the boat that looked like it had just been operated minutes ago. There was a blue the mug fuck? of coffee that was just sitting on a table that looked like maybe someone had been drinking from it recently. There was a neatly folded t-shirt on another chair with a set of glasses the on fuck? them. I mean, there was just all these kind of tells that this was a boat that was being used recently. And when Corey actually got to the front of the boat where the captain would stand, he saw the engine was actually still on. It was idling. And so Corey turned it off. Now, at this point, Corey knew his next step was going down the stairs and opening up the door that led into the cabin down below to see if Des, Peter, and Jim were down there. But he also knew when he went down there, despite there being backup up in the helicopter and more people making their way out here, Corey would be all alone if there were criminals or bad people down there. But this was his job. And so after taking a deep Doing breath, he turned from salt water. and walked down the few steps and he got to the door that led to the They cabin. had beer. That's he their water. The and he opened it up. 
and the room he was walking into was kind of like a half living room, half kitchen area. And he saw there was this table and on it was a newspaper that was dated April 15th. So the day the Kaz set sail. And then on the wall behind the newspaper was a calendar where days had been marked off all the way through April 14th. April 15th was not marked off. But also nearby on a table was a computer that was still plugged in and on and looked very much like someone had just been using it. And also there were plates of food that were out that didn't look that old that also seemed like people must have just been eating from the them. Fuck? And then also Corey could see past this common area into the bedroom and very obviously the bunks inside of there had been slept in. And so basically everything seemed like it was where it should be. There was just one problem. Des, Peter, and Jim were not on this ship. There they was no sign off? of where they were. They were just gone. And there was nobody else on board the ship. It was just completely abandoned with no sign of what happened. Des, Jim, and Peter were never found. And so we have no idea what, the what fuck? actually happened to them. Dude, there's not even... There's Oh, God, you can't leave me like that, dude. What the fuck? Dude, now I'm even more confused. Nor do we have any idea why they were seen by Isabel and the two men and the fishermen doing all these weird things like randomly piloting out towards open water, which totally went against their plan, which was stay close to shore, be safe. Or, you know, why on that second day they were seen in the same spot near Champagne Bay, indicating they had doubled back after going towards open water. You know, that went against their plan, which was point A to point B. Why Aliens? are they doubling 100%. back around? And so, unfortunately, that this explains whole thing everything. It's just one big mystery that has yet to be solved. Bruh, that wow, wow, that had a bunch of like. Since you made it to the end, real, real footage and shit, dude. That's creepy. <clears throat> that that was a good one. That last story was really fucking good. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribed? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.